Okay, you ready? Okay. I'm gonna put. This is for the children's Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me okay with this mic? Is the sound okay? What? Yes, yes, testing. I don't think it's on. No. Oh, no. Yeah, the bet. Did you guys? Okay. Hold on. Talk about this. <laughs> take two. Welcome to the 930 Easter Sunday service. We are so glad to have you. Um, welcome to those who are visiting with us for the very first time, those of us who are worshiping um, from home, and for those of you who I just see multiple times a week. I'm glad to see everyone. I'm so glad to see everyone this morning. I have a few announcements before we get started in worship. Um, the first is that we will not have uh, children's Sunday school today. We will have an egg hunt um, from 1030 to 11 on the lawn and in the playground. Um, so all around the church property in lieu of children's Sunday school. Um, we will resume next Sunday, April 11th at 1 p.m. our normal time. And children kindergarten through sixth grade are welcome to join us every week. We have some extra cinnamon roll tins available for sale. Um, so many of you supported our youth last Sunday on Palm Sunday, um, and I heard lots and lots of you saying how delicious they were. So we've got, I think, about eight or nine tins left. So if you would like to purchase them, that will go to the youth um, ministry. And um, the good news is, is that we are fully funded for the summer mission trip to Denver. Fully funded. I know, right? So exciting. So on behalf of myself, Sarah Pino, um, and Rachel Hershey, and our entire group, thank you all so much for your generosity. It is truly the generosity of this church and the other Billings Methodist congregations that made it possible. So... The cinnamon rolls that you buy today will just go towards normal youth ministry stuff. I don't know. We'll figure it out. Maybe crayons. Um, you guys don't use crayons. I don't know. Anyway, the, um, the food bank drive. We are having a food bank drive put on by our Hope Missions Committee this coming Saturday, April 10th. So in a few days, on April 10th from noon to 2 p.m., um, you are invited to drop off any sort of non-perishable foods that will be donated to, I think, either Billings Food Bank or Family Services, one of those. Uh, please let Janice Blancet, our missions committee chair, know if you would like to volunteer for the food drive. Uh, I talked about the, the egg hunt that we're going to have. There will be coffee and donuts in the, on the lawn um, during our fellowship time from 1030 to 11. This has been provided by the men of the church. So thanks to John Evans and the other guys, Bob Emmerd. So many of you helped out to provide this. Um, <clears throat> we are starting a new book study on the book of Acts. This will be led by Bob Emmerd, our Education Committee Chair, and myself, and it will begin on Wednesday morning, April 14th. So if you would like to join us um, starting April 14th at 10 a.m., we will be meeting in person in the Fellowship Hall. There is no special book other than the Bible. <laughs> 
that you need for this study. And uh, if you have any additional questions, please let myself or Bob know. Bob is in the back. Yep, he's talking to Antonia. Okay, uh, Jennifer Reiser, yeah, my SPRC chair. She and I are going to be um, having a rummage sale. Uh, and this will be raising money again for our general youth and children's ministry programming. I don't know, maybe the youth will go on a float trip this summer and it'll be great. Um, <clears throat> but we are going to do the rummage sale and it is going to be wonderful. Saturday, May 1st uh, from 10 a.m. until 2 or 3. I don't know, maybe until people buy all this stuff. The items that we are not accepting are electronics, any used swimsuits or undergarments, opened beauty products or food items. Um, but anything else we would love if you feel like it would be a treasure to someone else. And finally, Becky Muller would like everyone to know that she has set up a virtual MS walk for Saturday, May 15th. And the team name is Hope for All. Every year, the MS Society hosts a walk but because of COVID, it will be virtual this year. So if you are interested on going on a socially distanced walk with Becky, please let her know. Um, and she wants to thank all of you for the support that you have shown her and her family. If there are no other announcements. I would invite you all to take a deep breath and breathe in the joy of the resurrection. Our music meditation this morning is Easter Blossoms Forth, performed by our very own pianist, Jaden Osler. Let us worship the living God. Would you uh, please join with me in the call to worship? This day is like every other day. Long thoughts beat, covers were removed, coffee was brewed, weary bodies came to life. And yet this day is like no other day. For the sun rose, and we knew it was a miracle. The tomb was empty, and they knew it was love. So again and again we say, the longest night is over, death has lost its sting, Jesus is among us, hallelujah, 
Amen. Again and again and again. Alleluia. Amen. Friends, had we been there that first Easter morning, it is likely that many of us would have been with the disciples, hiding out in fear, locked behind doors, alone with our thoughts in the upper room. I wish I could say that I would have gone with the women, that I would have been brave and determined. I wish I could say that I would, would have held on to my faith, but the truth is we never know. What I do know is that Jesus came back for all of us, not for the few who maintained faith or for the few who stayed with him until the end. He came back for the broken and the afraid and for the cowardly and the greedy, for the women in the garden, for the disciples hiding in the upper room. He came back for those who betrayed him and those who worshiped him. He came back for you and for me. So join me in the prayer of confession, knowing that no matter where we are on this spectrum of faith, Jesus lived, loved, and returned for us. Let us pray. Beloved community, before God, before you, my family, I confess. I have seen the sunrise and withheld my praise. I have seen my neighbors suffer and withheld my aid. I have seen love extended and chosen to walk away. I have seen divisions deepen and managed to remain unfaced. We hear you. We see you. You are forgiven. God's love is like the sun. No matter how lost we are in the night, day after day, the light will find you. Rest easy. You are held in God's work. Thanks be to God, all men. And now we must pray. Beloved friend, before God and before each other, we confess. We have seen the sunrise and withheld our praise. We have seen our neighbors suffer and withheld our aid. We have seen the love extended and chosen to walk away. We have seen divisions deepen and manage to remain unfazed. I hear you, I see you, you are forgiven. God's love is like the sun, no matter how lost we are in the night, day after day, the light will find you. Rest easy, you are held in God's warmth. Thanks be to God, hallelujah, amen. Thank you, John. Before we get started with children's time, I just want us to take a moment and look at how amazing this is. The empty tomb that has been rolled away and the beautiful altar that Antonia Craighill built um, with the help of her daughter, Caitlin. So thank you so much, Antonia, for such a beautiful altar display for Easter. Oh, it's just beautiful. Yes, yes. Okay. Lovely. Just lovely. Oh. And it lights up. It's awesome. And we are so blessed to have Jaden Osler, our amazing pianist, this morning. We just have such a wonderful service and such a wonderful team. Um, so at this time, I would invite the children to come forward, and since there's no little kids in the service, maybe some kids at heart could come, slash teenagers who are really young adults, but you're just going to... Yes, okay, I'll talk to you from the, from the pews. You stay there. Okay, <clears throat> so they are all coming to the 11 o'clock. Sorry about that. <clears throat> I have some eggs in my basket. Um, this is a little plug for the mini egg hunt that we are going to have uh, during the 1030 to 11 o'clock donut fun time. So in my basket of eggs are five special eggs. These are no ordinary eggs. The first one is a cup of juice and a wafer. This is a communion cup that reminds all of us 
about the time that Jesus shared in his last meal with the disciples. And Jesus gave all the disciples a new commandment to love each other as Jesus had loved them. Jesus washed their feet that night and told them that every time they ate a meal, they drank the wine or the juice, and they broke the bread to remember the love that he has for us. So that is the very first special Easter egg. The second Easter egg that I have for all of you, children at heart, is the cross. Now this cross came in your Lenten kits, so beautiful. And the cross is a reminder to all of us that Jesus willingly chose to carry the cross to Calvary to die for all of us because God could not bear for us to keep beating ourselves over the head with our sin and our shame. So God came to rescue and redeem us. No one had to do it. God didn't have to do it, but God chose to do it. And because of the cross, we have life and life eternal. That is the second special Easter egg. The third special Easter egg are three nails. Now these three nails remind us that Jesus was nailed to the cross. So just like on Thursday when Jesus had his last meal with his disciples, on Friday, we call it Good Friday, Jesus was killed. There were kind of bigger nails than this. He suffered great pain, and he was driven into the hands of those who betrayed him and abandoned him just for being love, pure love. Inside is the fourth stone, or the fourth egg, which has a stone in it. And this is a much smaller stone than the stone over there that rolls away the empty tomb. In the Bible, we read that after Jesus died, they placed his body in a tomb and put a giant stone over the entrance. But on Sunday morning, the women went to see the tomb and saw that the stone had been rolled away and the tomb was open. So the stone reminds us that even giant, horrible, impossibly seeming blockage cannot keep Jesus from coming into our lives and bringing resurrection. And this brings me to the fifth egg. And the fifth egg is yellow to represent the sunrise and the resurrection. This egg is empty. Because we know that when Mary Magdalene and the women went inside the tomb, Jesus wasn't there. Jesus had risen, just as he said he would. So Jesus willingly took up the cross, died, and was resurrected for us to have life eternal and life to the fullest here on earth. We are so thankful for this very symbolic Easter basket. And every time you go on an Easter hunt, remember that Easter eggs and eggs in general are very symbolic for new life and new birth. Let us pray. We thank you, Jesus, for your love. That was, so great. that was so great. You were born. You lived. You died. And you were resurrected. We serve a risen Savior. Amen. Amen. All right. Wonderful. Just checking. Yes. Okay. So we have prayers, requests, and prayers of the people. So I would ask, since there's so many of you, if you have any additional prayer requests for us, um, please just shout them out. 
and we would love to be praying for you or celebrating with you, especially if there is a birthday coming up. I know it was Georgine Coble's birthday this past Thursday, so happy belated birthday, Georgine, and you're welcome on April 1st, and I know it is Lauren Allen's birthday this coming Tuesday, so happy almost birthday to Lauren. I have a wonderful praise that I got to officiate a wedding yesterday right here in the sanctuary. Janet and Bob Ulrich's son, John, married his beautiful fiance Wendy, and it was a very wonderful ceremony in the sanctuary. So congratulations to the Ulrichs and the new addition to their family. Prayers for Roddy Fergus's parents who are adjusting to new life and a new apartment. Barb Polaroy asked for prayers for her nephew, Peter, who was killed in a car accident last Saturday. Prayers for Barb and for her family during this time. Lois and Bob Frank request prayers for their daughter, Kelly, who is having lumpectomy surgery on April 14th. Kathy and Bill Bauman request prayers for their daughter, Mariah's business partner, who was in that terrible car crash in Great Falls this past week. Bobby Brazelton requests prayers for her daughter-in-law, Pam. Pam's mother had cancer surgery last year and is having a stent put in her kidney, this, or had a stent put in her kidney this last week, and they will biopsy soon. Cindy Schrader would like prayers for her niece, Pam, who is going to have a double mast mastectomy. And Becky Muller requests continued prayers for her nephew, Justin, who continues to battle multiple health issues. Are there any other prayer requests or praises that I haven't mentioned this morning? All right. Okay. I would like to offer a moment of silence for all of the unspoken prayers this morning. The things that we have shared that weigh heavy on our hearts. The things that only Jesus knows about. But the scripture reminds us to come to Christ when we are weary and heavy laden and he will give us rest. We give you praise, O oh God, because you are eternally victorious over death. In faithfulness, you have raised up Christ Jesus for us, and your mercy knows no end. God of life, we pray for those who are weighed down by hunger, injustice, uncertainty, or despair. You provide all good and perfect things, Lord. So we ask for provision for your people. Open your hands wide and satisfy the needs of every living thing. God of hope and resurrection, we trust in your righteousness and depend on your love. Be near to those who call upon you, who face sorrow, illness, injury, and death. Fulfill our longings for wholeness, healing, and new life. Hear all who cry out to you. Steadfast God, preserve us in your love that we might speak your praise and bless you forever. And it is in the name of the risen Christ, the name above all names, who teaches us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, we will be joining together, you can stand up, in our hymn, uh, 302 Christ the Lord is risen today. The words are printed in your bulletin. You feel free to sing along with us because Christ the Lord has risen today. Amen. Woohoo!
better than the Sunrise service because we didn't have Jaden and it was really fast. So praise the Lord for Jaden. Okay. John, I think it's I think it's you, right? Is it or it's Dorothy? Yay! Dorothy, it's all you. All right. Will you join me in the prayer for illumination? There are a million ways that you speak to us. God of garden and garden of the empty tomb. You speak to us in rituals, both formal and organic, in drops of water on foreheads, in vows set at the altar, through pieces of bread dipped in ordinary wine, and through shared candlelight on Christmas Eve. You speak to us in nature, your artistry showing up in starry nights, in the smell of pine, in rushing water, and in most every sunrise. You speak to us through our relationships, the comfort of a loved one, the laughter of our friends, the security of those who support and cheer us on. You speak to us in so many ways, and we are grateful for them all. However, today, we just need one. That would be enough. So lean down and breathe life into these sacred texts. We are craving to hear your word like never before. We are craving to understand, to see ourselves in the story. We are craving proximity to you. There are a million ways that you speak to us. Today, we just need one. With hearts full of gratitude, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dorothy. <clears throat> you may be seated. Wonderful. Our scripture reading this Easter morning comes from the Gospel of John chapter 20, and I will be reading verses 1 through 18 from the New International Version of the Bible. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciple started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head, the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? She said, They have taken my Lord away, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. He asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. 
Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my father and your father to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news saying, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So I have to say, I love in the Gospel of John and in all the Gospels, there's little personal details of who was writing. So that beloved disciple, the one that was the favorite, that's John. And the fact that he beat Peter and they were like running to the tomb first. And of course, the writer said, oh, and the beloved was there first. I just have to say that. I think that's hilarious. <sighs> oh, the oh, the humanness. So I love stories. I love to tell them. I love hearing them. And while I believe that everyone's story is beautiful, the resurrection story of Jesus Christ is the greatest story ever told. It's the story that has the power to impact and transform every other story, your story and mine. And in my theological opinion, it is only fitting for the resurrection story to be proclaimed by a woman on Easter Sunday. You see, all four Gospels account for the resurrection of Jesus. And while they all do differ slightly in specifics, like who, who ran to the tomb first, all four Gospels identify Mary Magdalene as the first witness of the empty tomb and the resurrected Christ. While the male disciples had fled the crucifixion scene, denied Jesus, and were now hiding in the upper room afraid, it was Mary Magdalene and the women that never left his side. Mary was the bravest disciple who didn't care about her status or her safety and went to the tomb early Sunday morning to tend to Christ's body. In the Synoptic Gospels, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Mary Magdalene is actually accompanied by a group of the female followers to the tomb. The women were going to anoint Christ's body as is tradition in Jewish burial with spices and perfumes. But they arrive at the tomb and the angels declare that Jesus had risen from the dead just as he said he would. In the Gospel of Matthew, it states that the women left the tomb with great fear and great joy to tell the other disciples. And in Luke, it says that the women remembered what Jesus taught them about the resurrection and realized what had happened. It clicked for them. They knew he had done what he said he would do. And this doesn't only confirm that they were brilliant, but it also confirms the fact that these women had been present for Christ's teachings and revelations and had taken those messages, those wonderful messages of three years, to heart. In the Gospel of John, our scripture reading this morning, Mary goes to the tomb alone when it was still dark and finds it empty. I'm sure her mind is racing at this point in the story. Someone had taken the body of her Lord. Maybe it was the religious leaders, the Pharisees or the Sadducees. And they, were, they had taken it to desecrate the body. Maybe the Roman soldiers had stolen Christ's body because they didn't want him to have a proper burial. So in her fear and her grief, Mary ran back to the men and returned to the garden with Peter and John the Beloved. Both men rushed into the tomb, saw the strips of linen where Christ's body had been, and believed. Here's the thing, though. They didn't believe that Jesus had been raised from the dead. They still didn't get that part. They believed that Mary was actually telling the truth about his body being missing. You see, women at this time in first century Palestine were considered unreliable witnesses. Author Rachel Held Evans wonders if this historic fact is why the Apostle Paul omits women entirely from the resurrection account in his letter to the Corinthian church. Sadly, all four Gospels 
say that the men did not believe the women when they told them that Jesus had risen from the dead and were only convinced, at least some of them were, when Jesus appeared to them in the upper room. So Peter and John fled the scene in terror, leaving Mary alone in the garden to mourn. And this wasn't a safe place to mourn either, loved ones. She was one of the only disciples to stay and watch Jesus die, so Mary probably had a hit out on her. She could have been captured or killed at any moment, but she stays to weep the loss of her Savior. She doesn't care at this point what fate awaits her because her Lord is gone. So she looks into the tomb just like the men had, but she sees something completely different. She sees angels where the men had seen emptiness. And the angels ask her why she is crying, and she explains that someone has taken the Lord. And then the impossible happens. Mary turns around and sees Jesus, but she doesn't recognize him at first. At first, she thinks he's the gardener who takes care of the garden where the tomb is. Jesus asks why she is crying, and she assumes this man, the alleged gardener, has taken Christ's body and moved it somewhere else. And then the miracle. Jesus says her name, Mary. At that moment, her eyes are open, and she realizes that it is her rabbi, her teacher, her friend and her savior. Death has not taken him. Christ has risen just as he said he would. And then Christ gives Mary the great commission. Go and tell the other disciples. So she runs. There's a lot of running. She runs and declares to the frightened men in the upper room, I have seen the Lord. Mary Magdalene is the first one to grasp the good news of the gospel in its entirety. That is the power of death and evil and sin has been defeated. That Christ has risen indeed. So, church family, loved ones, what does the Easter story teach us today? I think the first thing it teaches us is that some things seem so crazy They must be true. I remember taking an apologetics course at Denver Seminary, and apologetics is the defense of the Christian faith. In our class, the professor stated that all four Gospels identifying women as the first witnesses to the resurrection actually confirms that it really happened. Because here's the thing. Logically, if you were going to lie about something, don't you think you would want your lie to sound, I don't know, even a little bit legitimate, right? If they had lied, a more credible source would have been that a male disciple or even a religious leader that secretly loved Jesus like Nicodemus had been the first at the tomb. That would be more believable, but no. All four Gospels account for Mary Magdalene being the first at the tomb. I get asked all the time, you don't like actually believe in the literal resurrection, do you? Yes, I do. The literal resurrection of Jesus. I believe that Jesus actually, literally rose from the dead, just like he said he would. And I believe that that miracle continues to manifest in all kinds of miracles and resurrection in our world today. I wouldn't just stake my career on it, but I would stake my life on it. The fact that the resurrected Christ appeared to Mary and the other women in the Synoptic Gospels confirms that the good news of the gospel is for everyone. Not just for the wealthy, not just for half the population, not just for the privileged. The resurrection came first to one of the most marginalized in society, a woman. This proves that Christ ushered in a new era of life and liberation in the presence of women. And the fact that Christ sent them out as the first witnesses of the complete gospel story is perhaps one of the most bold, 
overt affirmation of female equality that Jesus could have or would have ever done. Which is why I don't understand so many denominations banning women from leadership and ministry. Christ clearly commissioned women to preach the good news, and he did it before he commissioned the men. Just read the Bible, people. (laughs) The other lesson this story teaches us is that the resurrection is messy, and it's not what you think it will be. It never is. Most of us don't stop and think about the significance of the fact that Mary mistook Jesus for a gardener. Think about that for a moment. Gardeners are dirty. I garden all the time. I'm gross afterwards. From my fingernails to my toes, gardeners have dirt and sweat all over. You see, most of us in our Sunday school felt boards are fed this image of the risen Christ being picture perfect with this miraculous glow and his long hair blowing in the wind. That is probably what Mary was expecting, but that's not what happened. Easter isn't all about looking our best and having the prettiest flowers and making sure your robe is dry cleaned and going to brunch and ordering mimosas. All those things are good, yes. But that's not what Easter is about. We learned that last year, right? In lockdown. Easter is about a God who loved us so much that God came into the mess and the muck of life to be with us and to bring us newness, resurrection, and redemption. Nothing can stop that. I am so glad that our Lord and Savior didn't look like a combination of a Disney prince and Captain America. Because that's not real. That's not relatable. If the resurrected Jesus is really good news for everyone, then he needed to be messy. And he was. The God of the universe who came and lived and died for us on a cross doesn't want to make us perfect doesn't want to make us clones. What he cares about is making us new. Pastor Nadia Boltz-Weber talks about the newness of the resurrection in this way. New looks like recovering alcoholics. New looks like reconciliation between two loved ones, neither of which actually deserve it. New looks like every time I manage to admit I was wrong and every other time I manage not to mention when I'm right. New looks like a fresh start and every act of forgiveness and every moment of letting go of what we thought we couldn't live without and somehow lived without it anyway. New is the thing you never saw coming, never even hoped for, but ends up being all you ever needed. End quote. Finally, I think the story of the resurrection teaches us that resurrection happens even in the dark. If we reread the very beginning of John chapter 20, we will realize that Mary went to the tomb, not when the sun was rising, when it was dark. I'm not a morning person, as most of you know, but I have been up before the sunrise before, this morning in fact. It's cold, And scary, the moon is out, it's a little disorienting. And I'm sure that's what Mary was experiencing when she walked to the garden tomb. She thought death and sin and evil had won. She thought the story was over. But as theologian Frederick Buchner says, resurrection means that the worst thing is never the last thing. The Easter story proves that no heartbreak, no addiction, no grief, no injustice can last where the risen Christ is proclaimed. Even in the darkness, Christ brings us resurrection again and again. Christ's light shines in the darkness and the darkness cannot and will not overcome it. We have been through Hell and back this year, loved ones. We have lived in the pain and the suffering of COVID-19, and it's still not over. But even in a global pandemic, the Easter story reminds us that the worst thing is never 
the last thing. And because of the resurrection, God is able to pull us out of the pits, out of our graves that we dig for ourselves, and love us back to life over and over and over again. So know this morning, no matter how dark things might seem, your story isn't over. The story isn't over. Christ's resurrecting power is working behind the scenes A new life is coming. Even if you can't see it, even if Jesus is disguised as a gardener right now, and if you don't believe me this morning, that's okay, because I will believe it enough for the both of us. Happy Easter, church family. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Will you join me in the affirmation of faith? We know the fear of the upper room. We know the feeling of hard days and long nights. We know the grief of the tomb and the particular ache of saying goodbye. We know the pain of Good Friday and we know the darkness before dawn. And still, and still, we believe. We believe that again and again the sun will rise again and again. God will draw near again and again. We will march toward justice again and again. The tomb will be empty again and again. Love will win again and again. God will lead the church again and again and again and again we will be loved the journey will not be perfect we will need to rise before dawn we will need angels along the way but again and again the sun will rise we believe amen And now Jaden Osler is going to play my favorite Easter song, the Hallelujah Chorus by Handel. Enjoy.
sending us, Jaden. Oh, amen. That was so beautiful. Amen. Okay. All right. At this time, we are moving to Holy Communion. Um, we will be doing communion in a more normalized way. Um, so you are invited to come forward after um, the liturgy of communion and the prayer. If you do not want to come forward and you would like me to bring um, communion to you, I can absolutely do that. Oh, Neri, can you? I need um, plastic gloves. They're at the door. Can you grab me two? Yep. Thank you. Pl- awesome. My mother-in-law's here. It's the best. Um, I know, right? Isn't that great? Okay. So um, we will be doing Marge Darkenwall's Amazing Communion Bread. So you can come up and receive that. And then your cup of hope, um, the juice will be the normal little juice things because there's just no COVID-friendly way we can do that. So anyway, all right. Thank you, Mary. Hope you're the best. Um, <clears throat> Honestly, it's like surprising I even remembered the things that I remembered this morning, but not everything. Um, all right. Can we move over here? This communion liturgy was written by our very own Pastor Sarah Clark, um, who I am very sad is going to another church soon. So this is very special, special, special for me. We come to the table as we are, knowing we have been invited and loved, and that whoever we are, wherever we have been, wherever we are going in this moment, in this space, we belong. Christ joins us. So, beloveds of God, again and again, we come to the table that stretches as wide as God's love, Again and again, we take the bread as Christ did. On the night, he gave himself up for us. Oh my goodness. He gave himself up for us when he blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body broken, as we are all broken, given for you, for your healing and for all wholeness. Again and again, you will need to remember this. So when you eat and share, may you know my love for you. Again and again, we take the cup. As Christ did at the supper was ending, when he blessed it, gave thanks to God, and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant of new life offered to you and to many and to all sealed in my love. Again and again, you will need to remember this. So when you drink and share, may you trust that this cup will sustain you as you build the kingdom of justice, love, and grace. May we too remember Christ's love. May we too trust in Christ's presence and power As together we proclaim the mystery and joy of our faith, repeat the words after me. Christ has died. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Christ will come again. Amen. Let us pray. Resurrection, God, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ Jesus that we might be Christ's body in the world, redeemed by his love, a witness to his grace. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with one another, and one in ministry to the world, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, which is in every place where your people gather in love. All honor and glory and power are yours, almighty God now and forever. Amen. Methodists have what is called an open table for communion. This means that everyone, absolutely everyone, is invited to come up and receive the bread of life and the cup of hope this morning. If you would like us to bring communion to your seat, simply raise your hand. The table is ready and all are welcome to receive God's grace this morning. John, would you help me in 
it's time for our offertory. Um, <clears throat> there are three different ways that you can give to the mission and ministry of God. There we go. The first is by giving online to hopeumcbillings.org and clicking the donation button. The second is by writing a check to Hope UMC at P.O. Box 50066. And the last is by putting it in the black offertory tin, which John Evans will be standing next to on your way out um, to the fellowship time on the lawn. So we want to thank all of you for your financial donations. All of the money that we receive for Easter Sunday and all of the special Easter offertory and tithes will be going towards our building fund to help pay off our mortgage um, that means so much to us. The ministry of hope is just beginning. So thanks be to God for your financial partnership and donation. Will you join me in the prayer of dedication? Generous God, this morning we give you praise. You the glory, we give you thanks. With resurrection humming in our hearts, our minds are tuned to your song of peace. We joyfully present these gifts to you, a tangible chorus of thanksgiving, a harmony of hope for your kingdom come. Amen. Thank you so much, Dorothy and John Evans, for being our liturgists today. Um, I would like for us to leave with a pastoral benediction before we sing our choral benediction. As Christ burst forth from the tomb, may new life burst forth from us and show itself in acts of love and healing to a hurting world. And may the same Christ, who lives forever and is the source of our new life, keep your hearts rejoicing and grant you peace this day and always. Alleluia. Amen. Amen. Please join me. You can stand as we sing, Enfold Us in Your Love.